Amen. So for you guys that are online as well, we just want to say welcome to you. We love that you are here on Father's Day, and we welcome you guys today. Uh, we're going right into the book of James. Our passage today starts in James chapter 3, verse 1. So if you would, take out your Bibles or your smartphones or however you look at Scripture. This is what we're going to be walking through today. James 3, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, just a quick, quick little uh, thing here that James says. He's about to talk about all the words that we say, the way that we use our mouth. And he starts by saying teachers especially should be careful about what they say. Amen? Because when you teach other people, not only do you have the potential to give them life and to set them on the right road, but you also have the potential to deceive and give people the wrong view of Scripture, specifically in the church, and the wrong view of God. So if you're a teacher today or you aspire to be a teacher, you ought to be trembling in your boots just a little bit when James says that. Verse 2, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. When he uses that word perfect there, the Greek is mature, not, not sinless, but mature. He says, if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect, and we could also control ourselves in any other way. Now, the thing I want to point out to you there in verse 2 is he says, we all make many mistakes. Now, I've, I've said uh, weeks leading up to this that James is like the Gordon Ramsay of the New Testament, right? He's like right after us, super direct, super truthful, does not mind sharing difficult truths with us. But in this moment, I love that he says what he says. He says, we all make mistakes. We all have a problem with our mouth is what he's about to go into. And as Pastor James, he lumps himself in which we should always do in the church because there's only one perfect person in the church, amen? And his name is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And James knows that, and James lumps himself in with the rest of us partly because this is going to be a tough passage, and he knows we need it. One of the sayings we got here at Grace Fellowship Church is, it's okay to not be okay. Let's say that again. It's okay to not be okay. You're supposed to amen right there. Can I get one right there? It's okay to not be okay. It's okay that you fought in the minivan on the way here this morning to get to church. It just is. It's okay that you slept in and that you were late getting to worship. It's okay that you're broken a little bit. It's okay that this was a tough week. It's okay that you're coming into Father's Day and you forgot a Father's Day gift. Amen? It's okay. It's okay to be a bit broken because we can take those masks off in church and we can be real with, with each other. But the second half of that statement is also very important. But our Father loves us too much to leave us where we are. So it's not it's okay to not be okay and we're just going to live the rest of our lives broken in a mess. It's that we're all coming to the doctor together and the doctor is God and he's got good plans for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So next, verse 3. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. So Pastor James has got two sermon illustrations for us today. So he's talking about the way that we use our mouth, the way that we use our words. And when he does, he, he uses these two pictures, a large horse and a large ship. Think of a cruiser ship. And he says, for the horse, there's a small bit in his mouth, maybe 3,000 pound stallion, right? About to run a race. And there's a tiny little jockey on his back controlling where he steers left or right. Same thing with a ship. Small rudder on the back of a ship. You guys have seen that. Very, very small item controls a very, very large thing. And you are the exact same way. I looked up the weight of the average male human tongue this morning. It's 15% of a pound. You know how much you weigh? That's a very small percent of your overall body weight is that tongue. And just a little fun fact for you. Did you know, statistically speaking, the lady's tongue weighs even less? And some of you are like, she's got a very big mouth. Statistically, you're wrong. I'm just saying, saying, little plug there. So the, the, the issue isn't so much just that it's small, 
But in both of James's pictures, when he's talking about the way that we use our words, what's he saying? He picks two pictures that talk about control. See, the bit controls the horse. The rudder controls the ship. And what James is saying is there is some control here of your life. And a lot of it happens with your words. Does that make sense this morning? A lot of it happens with your words. Sometimes we speak and we say, you know, the words just came out of my mouth. I don't know what happened. James comes to us and says, you're not out of control. Don't, don't play victim when it comes to your words. Be careful with talk like that. Also, the way that you talk has an ability to steer your life. Do you ever find yourself saying things like, you know, I'm sick all the time. I'm in pain all the time. I can never get anything done. Things are just getting, in my life, COVID, tougher and tougher and tougher. The world is getting worse and worse and worse. We never in our family have enough money. We are so busy all the time. Did you know that when you say things like that about your life, yourself, your family, do you know you're steering your family? You know you're steering your day. You're steering your experience. You're sowing into you truths that are big and not necessarily the direction that you want to go. So be careful how you steer yourself. Verse 5. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole fi life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. How do you really feel about it, James? So he uses fire here. Again, another really great picture. And you'll see it with all of these. Every picture James chooses today for the tongue, in order to explain this to us, is something that has the potential for both good and evil. So go to fire there for a second. So this is a negative picture. But isn't fire supposed to be something else? Isn't fire supposed to be warmth? Isn't it a tool given by God to us to create light, to cook food, to do all the things that we need to do? He's just saying, you take that wonderful tool of God and it's out of control. You take that wonderful tool of God and you direct it in the wrong way. And then bad things happen. And all of a sudden you've got a forest fire. Now, what in the world is he talking about here with a forest fire? How can the words that we say in this life create that level of damage and destruction? Can I give you some ideas to consider? Here's a slide of ideas. How about constant criticism? Sometimes we go to speak something constructive to someone. They need to tweak this. They need to work on that. They need to adjust. And it can be nice in the beginning. But then something about us comes in and, you know, I said it once, but I really want to control and guarantee the outcome that this person will change. Sometimes because their behavior is uncomfortable to me. Amen? Is anybody with me today? And so what do I do? I don't just say it once. I say it a lot. And I keep saying it. And I say it so much and so often. It sends a deeper message to the individual. And there's damage there through constant criticism. Forest fire. Next is cruelty. We know what that's about. What about being two-faced? I criticize you to other people behind your back. Maybe because I'm a people pleaser and I don't want to say truth to your face. So I'll say truth to other people about you. And then when I'm around you, I act like everything's okay. Ever do that? Oh, we got to be careful what, what our tongue can do. How about mocking people? Mocking people, this is something, this, this idea of mocking is something that is specifically, it, it, it's almost like a professional sport in our culture. The news commentators do this especially. They don't just have a reasoned argument about their particular position. They mock the other side and disparage the character of the other side in order to destroy them fully. And we watch that and we consume that as Christians. And then sometimes we're surprised that that same kind of mocking behavior comes out of us toward the people that we care about. 
be careful of what you feast on. You might find it coming out of your own mouth. It's, it's, it's not meant to be that way. Social influencers do the exact same thing. Next is gossip. Gossip is like fire, amen? Like we totally get that. Gossip is like fire. It spreads quickly. It wreaks havoc. Gossip can destroy people. Right, and that's in your school, that's in your church, that's, that's on Twitter for sure every single hour, right? Is anyone else distracted by the camera in the middle of the room right now? <laughs> Everybody say hi to Jason. Jason's this great guy. He knew that you were all going to be dressed up so nice and pretty for Father's Day, so he wanted to come and get a little video for our website. So it's awesome. Exaggerations are next. What about exaggerations? We say things to people, but... But we don't just make it truthful and accurate. We, we have to over-embellish. And something could, that could take like this, this, this little fine-pinned hammer, we bring a wrecking ball to the situation sometimes, don't we? We say things like, you never, ever wash a dish in our entire house, ever. And it's an expression of how we feel, not, not the facts. And when we do that, when we, when we make our words reflect how we feel and not the facts, we end up damaging people. Do you see what James is talking about? Is any of this hitting this morning? Right? Like this, is, this, this hits close to home. How about, how about comparisons? You're just like your dad. It's, when you do that, it's just like your mom. You're just like your mom. Oh, this is not marriage counseling, but you need to hear that one today. I'm telling you, frustrated words. It's the same thing um, as, the, as the constant criticism. Sometimes it's the frustration that comes through my words that turns a, a really nice, healthy coaching moment, especially with our kids, into something that's damaging. Because when they sense the frustration behind it, we your kids ever, my, my kids do this to me. They, they'll say, Dad, you yelled at me. It's like, my voice was not elevated. What are we talking about right now? It, it has nothing to do with volume, Dad. It has everything to do with the fact that we could sense the emotion behind your words. So it wasn't calm and loving and patient. Instead, it was this force was behind it. Frustrated words. Be careful of that. How about identity-destroying words? You are a lazy person. You can't do that, period. You're no good at it, period. Those kinds of words... And then self-talk. Self-talk is kind of my junk drawer um, uh, category for any of those other things, and we speak them to ourselves. You ever do that? Pick almost any of these, and we do it to ourselves. And the deceptive thing about that is we'll speak those things to ourselves in our self-talk No one else can hear it. And we think it's okay that we do that to ourselves because it's just us and I deserve it anyway and nobody else is getting hurt. And what we do is we sow that kind of talk into ourselves and eventually we find it coming out of our own mouths. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, it's a lie from the pit of hell, isn't it? It's told to us as kids, like, hey, when they come after you, those bullies, they come after you verbally, you ought to be strong. But what it's done to us as kids is it, it, it says, I ought not to feel pain. And so then we deny pain when it comes from the words, and it's just not true. Verse 7, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless, and it's evil, full of deadly poison. Now, why did James take this right turn here? If you remember from previous weeks, you've gotten a sense of how James talks. He's always imagining somebody giving him an answer or fighting back with him. And so James has been giving us all this stuff, and here's what he's imagining. He's imagining a good church Christian saying, okay, Pastor James, I'll work hard on what I say. I'll work really, really hard, and I'll change the way I talk today and change the way I talk tomorrow. And James comes back and says, you can't. Don't think for a second that you can tame this thing. You can't. You can't control it. You can't fix you on your own. Then why are you even preaching this to me, dude? Why? If I can't tame it, 
Look at what he says next. Verse 9. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. Sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. You can never ever curse another human being made in the image of God, which by the way is all of them. Ever. And so blessing and cursing, they come out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So he says, you can't tame this thing. And then he goes and he gives us a few more sermon illustrations. He says, it's kind of like a spring and it's either going to be fresh water or salty water. Or it's kind of like a tree, and we talked about trees last week. It's either going to be a tree that has figs growing on it or grapes growing on it. It depends on what kind of tree it is. And what's his point? His point is what you end up getting has to do with the source. What's the source? If the source is a freshwater spring, you're going to get fresh water. If the source is a fig tree, you're going to get figs. He's telling us, to work on the source. Don't work on your words. See, Ken, you can be here today and you can be like, I'm going to work really hard, pastor, I promise. It's not what he's steering us to. Look at this. This is, this is what Jesus said and Jesus always says it better, amen? Matthew 15, verse 18. But the words that you speak come from where? Your heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts, and murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. Jesus says the words that you speak, it's not a matter of self-control necessarily. It's a reflection of what's going on inside of your heart. You want to change your words? Change your heart. Pastor Rick Warren says it like this. He says, a person with a harsh tongue has an angry heart. A person with a negative tongue has a fearful heart. A person with an overactive tongue has an unsettled heart. A person with a boasting tongue has an insecure heart. A person with a filthy tongue has an impure heart. A person who is critical all the time has a bitter heart. On the other hand, he says, a person who's always encouraging, they've got a happy heart. A person who speaks gently, They've got a loving heart. A person who speaks truthfully has an honest heart. So here's the good news. Our God, he specializes in heart change. That's what he does. And so what James is leading us to, very, very carefully, he's led us to this moment and said, what you need is heart change. And so you got to go to Jesus and say, change my heart. So how does that actually work? Well, Okay, walk through this with me. Like, I say I've spoken some criticism to my kids. And you know what I want to do instead? I want to speak vision to them. I want to speak vision about who they are and about where they're going. I want to speak that kind of thing to my kids. You know what I do? I go to God in my quiet time, and I say, God, would you give to me in my heart, in the deep place, would you give to me vision for my kids? Like, I don't want to just speak, like, hallmark words over them. God, tell me a vision for my kids. Pray it every day. Pray it every day until he gets, gives it to you. And it's when he gives that to you and it's real and you can actually see your kids the way God sees your kids, then guess what? Those words will start to come out of you naturally as if you changed the spring and then the right kind of water comes out. Does that make sense to you today? So we go to God, we say supernaturally, You've got to change my heart. And by the way, I only have to pray that prayer five minutes for my kids because my kids are incredible. They're incredible. It's not hard at all. It doesn't take days. It doesn't take weeks. Maybe I've got brokenness with my spouse. And maybe in my brokenness with my spouse, and I'm like, God, my words are out of control. And maybe he comes to you in the quiet place and he says, you know what? The reason your words are out of control is because all that bitterness, it's unforgiveness that's deep inside of you. And so you're going to start praying forgiving prayers toward your spouse of all the big stuff that they've done, but also all the little stuff that they've done. And God, I need you to wash this bitterness out of me over time. And I'm willing to do the hard work. 
And God, maybe we are going to go to counseling together. And God, maybe you are going to change me supernaturally. And maybe it's not one or the other. Maybe it's all the above. And we're going to read some books and I'm going to work on me. And because when I work on me and my heart toward my spouse starts to change, which God can do, God can do it. Then the words will change. Then the words will change. That's how it works. Jesus changed my heart. We're going to pray a prayer right now because I want to pray for this heart change. I want to show you how much I believe in this because we are midway through the message. We're not done. Don't get excited, okay? But we're going to pray. We're going to ask God right here in this moment to start working heart change. And, And as we pray this, I want you to think about what kind of heart change you want. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask you to come into our life right now. And Lord, would you discern where our words are out of control? What kind of fire is coming out of us? What kind of destruction, Lord? And Lord, what is at the heart of that thing? And Jesus, would you come in, Lord, in your tenderness and your love for us, and would you start to change us from the inside out? Or we want to experience it for real. We don't, want to, we don't want to fake change. We don't want to get temporary change, Lord. We want to go deep today, Lord. And Jesus, you're the only one who can do that in us. So would you do that, Lord Jesus? In Christ's name, amen. So it's Father's Day, and, and we're going to spend the, the second half of the ma- message taking what James has said and kind of marrying it up um, to our experience as dads. Um, I did a little study on Father's Day. Did you know Father's Day started with um, a little girl um, whose dad had been a Civil War veteran, and she had like six brothers and sisters, and the mom had died, and dad took care of them all so well, she petitioned Congress to start Father's Day as a national holiday. Did you know that? Um, and we celebrate in all kinds of ways today. Um, in the Netherlands, the way that they uh, uh, celebrate Father's Day is every single dad gets breakfast in bed, which I think should come to the United States. <laughs> Amen? I absolutely think it should. So as a down payment on breakfast in bed, we have bacon for you today because we call this Bacon Sunday here at Grace Fellowship Church. So enter the bacon people. Give them a hand if you would. Let's go, bacon people. So we've got napkins are going to pass across and bacon on a stick. Everybody gets some. Even if you're not a dad, feel free to grab some bacon today. Thank you, Brooke. Brooke brought me two pieces because she wants me to choke to death before the end of the sermon. (laughs) Everybody gets bacon today. Uh, We've had people who have been grilling bacon uh, all morning long, got here super early, and we are so thankful for them. Uh, And I'm going to try. If you're watching at home right now and you don't have a slice of bacon in front of you, I'm so sorry. Um, (laughs) You should go and get yourself some bacon bits or something and put it on a cracker, but please join us in this because it's so good. Mm. Pray for me. In the past, I have just about choked to death, haven't I? I've done pretty well today so far. It's all right. Mmm. This is the official bacon break. Online, you can't see it, but we're about halfway across the room right now. People are getting really choosy about the bacon on the tray. That's the problem, Mm -hmm. which I don't blame you at all. It's worth it. Okay. While you're eating and still passing trays, I'm going to keep going with the message. Okay, I don't want to be late. So here's the second half of the message. How do we bring this to dad's? How do we bring this whole thing about the way that we use our mouth? How do we bring it to fatherhood? Here's a verse for you to consider. This is Psalm 68, verses 5 through 6. And this is such a huge verse for me. It says, Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families, and he sets the prisoners free. Isn't that a good verse? Such a good verse. God is the father to the fatherless. Why do we need to know that today? We need to know it because some of you, we're sitting here talking about Father's Day, and there's all kinds of brokenness 
about dads in your life. And God, even before that brokenness was ever conceived, God knew it. And he came and he said these words in the Psalms. He says, I am the father to the fatherless. I am what's going to be right and patient and loving and full of vision for you the way that an earthly father maybe wasn't. And God's going to do that. And I love that. Um, Part of my own story, some of you guys know this, part of my own story is that for the first 20 years of my life, my dad and I were super broken with each other. My parents divorced when I was really young, and my dad lived in a town about an hour away. We just didn't see each other that often, and there was all kinds of brokenness to that. I was pretty, pretty mad at him, pretty bitter at him. It wasn't until about 20 years old that forgiveness came in, and we began to rebuild our relationship. It took some time, though. But in those early days, I grew up at this little Baptist church, and they believed what James said. Do you remember the the passage we looked at the very first week we were together on James? And he said, true religion is this, that you would take care of widows and orphans. And there were men in that little Baptist church where I grew up, and they looked at that verse right there, and they said, Josh is kind of an orphan. I wasn't really. But they just saw, saw a gap. And they said, we're going we're gonna to step into that gap. And there were several spiritual fathers that came along in my life and stepped into that gap. So I'm going to celebrate those spiritual fathers right now to you. First one is George Zimmerman. First of my adoptive dads. He's the good looking guy in the black socks right there. <laughs> Man of style, George Zimmerman. Um, I cannot express enough about this guy. World War II Army veteran. Uh, carpenter, head of his labor union, um, president of the credit union that he helped start with some other people, owned a side catering business. He was elected to the high school board, and he served as one of our church elders for as long as I can remember. He was in every way the definition of what a man was supposed to be in my life, and I'm thankful for him. He jumped into my life. He filled every need that he possibly could in a broken situation. He was there all the time. He fixed everything. And I mean literally everything. Anything that broke in our house, George Zimmerman would come over and fix it. Every time it snowed, which it did a lot in Illinois, he would drive his truck across town and he would clear our uh, 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 sidewalks. That's the word. Sidewalks. He would clear the sidewalks off before I was even awake. When Linda and I went to get married, it was George and Betty Zimmerman's marriage that I wanted our marriage to be like, because he was a hero to me, a true hero. And because he was all that and a whole heck of a lot more, he was the first person that mattered that told me that he was proud of who I was. And when he face-to-face told me he was proud of who I was, I can tell you exactly where I was sitting and exactly the moment that it was. And I teared up, and it was super meaningful to my life. It's one of the foundational stones of my life. How do you think James would see George Zimmerman and the way that he used his mouth to pour into my life? Not a forest fire, life-giving. Amen? It's George Zimmerman. That's just one. Next, Harold Lindsay. Harold Lindsay also went to my Baptist church growing up. <clears throat> he told my mom one day that he was going to pick me up for an overnight fishing trip. And he came and picked me up. And I was in grade school at the time, super, super young, and stayed overnight at his house. And his wife, Faye, made um, pudding on the stove, which I didn't even know was a thing at the time, but it was incredibly tasty. And he had a pool table in his basement, which I figured only rich people had pool tables in their basement. And so we played pool, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And then we woke up next morning. While it was still dark, I thought I was going to die. While it was still dark, and then he drove me to this greasy little diner called Ernie's. We ate breakfast, and then he took me fishing all day long on the Illinois River. And the man taught me how to fish. And I bet he did that two or three times every single year during my grade school years. Harold Lindsay would come and take me fishing just like that. Harold Lindsay was not a Bible study leader. He was not an elder and he was not a teacher in the church. What was he? He was just a good man who loved Jesus, who saw somebody with a gap. And he decided to come in and use what he had. 
So you men here in the church, you often look at what's going on in the church and you say, I don't have the skills to do that thing as a man. You can stop talking to yourself that way. You see a gap. Jesus, am I to fill that gap? I'm going to go over there and help that person. Real practical. Man just taught me how to fish. Isn't that amazing? How do you think James would look at that? Amazing stuff. Next, I will talk about my dad because in the age uh, line here. He kind of came in when I reached adulthood, and, and he and I started to walk through forgiveness together. That's us um, working on some concrete mix in a wheelbarrow together. Um, after, after about 20, and I forgave him, we started work on the bitterness, and the, the, the healing power of Jesus came into that relationship between the two of us, started to spend time together. It took a while. It takes a while and the forgiveness came, and we got closer and closer and closer. We got so close, especially in, the, in these recent years. The bond was so strong that when he died last year, it wrecked me. It just broke me. And I was kind of mad about it at first. Now I've got joy in it. Because the pain is proof that God gave us something pain is proof that God built something between the two of us. And what I feel is the tearing of that away. I miss that guy. Can't wait to see him again. It's going to be a good day. I get to see him again. But I was late, late 20s, early 30s. My pastor had come to me and said that I should be a pastor. And, and um, I was walking away from a 10-year career um, in technology and we had two little ones at home, and Linda was pregnant with our third. And I had to tell people that I was making this transition. And the scariest person to tell was my dad. Because I was working for Caterpillar. He'd worked at Caterpillar all his life, even, even retired from there. And I knew the speech he was going to give me, right? The speech was going to be, how dare you? You've got a mortgage, dude. Like, you've got all this financial stability. You've got young kids at home. They're not going to pay you very good at the church. I knew all that was going to come. So we went to Corey's Pub together and sat in this corner, um, uh, corner table, and they have good fried mushrooms there at Corey's. And, and we sat down, and we had this conversation, and, and I told them what was going on. I was all ready for the speech, and the speech did not come. Instead, he said very quickly to me, he said, I knew one day you would be a pastor or a politician. <laughs> he, was, he wasn't a poet, okay? <laughs> so, I'm like, what do you mean by that, Dad? You're good with people. You've always been good with people. I knew you'd work with people. And I knew you'd serve a cause, something important. And when he said that, and he said that so quick, okay, the speed matters, right? When he said it, and he said it so quick, the, the, this was not hallmark words spoken over me. This is something he'd been thinking about, and he knew. And so when the moment came, it came out of him. What do you think James would say about that? He'd say, well, there was a good spring there in his heart toward his son, and so the words matched that. He spoke life into me. So many stories I could tell you, especially, again, that latter part of my life with my dad, but God did so much, sowed so much into my life through him, and I want to honor him today. Next is Bob C. Bob C. was my lead pastor for about 20 years. Bob and Harriet had been missionaries to Japan for seven years. They had a passion for lost people, and they believed in the gospel. And their lives backed that whole thing up. Um, Bob didn't like titles. You couldn't call him Pastor Bob. He'd stop you. It's just Bob. Unless you had a little kid with you, and you're trying to teach him how to be respectful, and you're like, no, it's Pastor Bob. To the little, He'd let you do that. But that was it. Just humble man. Wanted the church to be a humble place. Um, he always put family first. 
I'd served as an elder before I became a pastor, and, and so that's kind of that volunteer leadership team in the church, and so I'd served along with Bob, and <clears throat> one of the things I'd seen in him is that you could never, ever schedule a church event or something that he had to be at while one of his boys was playing baseball. They were big into baseball, and there were baseball games that felt like every single day when you looked at his calendar, but we would try to schedule things, and you know, you got like 10 elders on this board. You're trying to schedule stuff. And they're like applying pressure to him, right? Like we're trying to schedule this thing, dude. Like find a spot on your calendar that fits the rest of our stuff. And these are the guys that are like leaders at their jobs and stuff. And he's like, absolutely not. He would not budge on that. It's like, I don't care what my role is. I don't care what cause you think we're doing, what ministry you think we're doing. It's family first. My ministry's to my family first. And he protected that. And he sewed that into me, and I saw that, and I learned it, and I tried to bring that into my own family. Such a big deal. I remember um, the very first time he had me preach a sermon. And we're in this, this uh, sanctuary, and, and it probably seats like 350, 400 people, this sanctuary does. And he's like, go preach it. He's like, I'll come with you. And the whole thing is empty, and he's sitting in the front row, and he listens to the entire sermon start to finish. And he laughed at every single one of my jokes. It's weird preaching to an empty room with one guy in the front row. But he was trying to sow into me. He, he told me later, he's like, that's the worst sermon you'll ever preach in your life. And it's done. <laughs> he might not have been right, but it was done for sure. <laughs> um, another thing I remember Bob would say is he, he would say, uh, heaven and hell are real places. And if you're a Christian and you believe that's true, you'll actually care about people's souls and you'll actually tell them the truth about their destiny. Heaven and hell are real places. He sewed that into me. Next is Kirk Bodie. Kirk Bodie, there he is on screen. When Linda and I first got married, young, passionate Christian, I wanted to see how church was done. And I remember we visited this church and Kirk Bodie was preaching that, that Sunday, and he did an amazing job, just taught the Bible, just, I mean, everything was so, so cool, um, learned a lot from him, learned later that Kirk is not a pastor, that he was an elder at that church, he's a lawyer full time. Some of you guys got feelings about lawyers, right? He would win the award almost every year for the quality of pro bono work that he would do for people. He was just always giving always generous. And he loved God's word so much that they would have him preach. And you looked forward to whenever Kirk would preach in that church. And he would take seminary classes. He took seminary classes on the side for as long as I knew him. There's so many stories I could tell you about Kirk. The, uh, the time that we were actually praying about leaving Illinois to come here. And Linda and I, like, like we thought God was leading us, but we weren't sure. We wanted to pray about it. We just kind of had this moment. And it's like, I remember we, we called up Kirk and his wife, Barb. And we called up Bob C. and his wife, Harriet. And the four of them came over because these were our mentors, right? These were the people. These were the spiritual parents that had poured into us. And they came and they laid hands on us and they prayed. And when they prayed, they all agreed. They're like, you're supposed to go to Oklahoma. They all told us that that night. And just, what would James think about all that? Last two I'll give to you. I just thought of these guys this morning. This is Denny Zimmerman is on one side. He's in the gray shirt. And then Jim Rinella is on the other in the, in the suit there. Denny Zimmerman, again, that Baptist church, my goodness. Um. Denny, when I was a, a teenager, he set aside a Saturday and he took our fellowship hall, spread out a bunch of electrical equipment and brought a bunch of us teenage boys in and said, I'm going to teach you how to wire an electrical box. I'm going to teach you how to install a switch, teach you how to install a light. So about two months ago, I was with my mom and her ceiling fan had gone out while I was visiting her and, and I, I'm up there in her living room switching out this ceiling fan and she's sitting in her recliner looking up at me and she gets this smile and she's like, Denny Zimmerman taught you how to do that. I remember that. Like, yep. Yep. Jim Rennell was my mentor in college, taught me how to read the Bible for the first time. At, read it, read it. Like, God, speak to me, read it. 
taught me how to pray, taught me how to mentor other people. Jim Ranella, amazing guy, gave me my first book on grace and said, you can never learn too much about God's grace. You can never preach about God's grace too much. He handed me that first book. See, I'm up here and my entire life is standing on the shoulders of better men than myself. You know that? And that's true. Do you see that in yourself? James is like, speak life. And sometimes speaking life takes risk and it takes time. Speak life. Happy Father's Day. Be spiritual fathers. Be spiritual mothers to others. For the folks that were spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers to you, maybe you've woken up to that this morning. Maybe you can see that in yourself this morning. Maybe you need to make a call, send an email, thank them. Amen. Amen. Take out your programs if you would. Just final, final thing. On the very back of it, there's some boxes there. One says name, says I'll say this. I'll speak this. Maybe God's sitting here speaking to you and says, there's a person in your life you're supposed to speak these words to. So let's not focus so much on what we shouldn't say. Let's let's focus on what we should say, right? So write a name there. There's pens in the seat back in front of you. They're there for a reason. Grab that pen, write a name down there, write some words that you should speak that are gonna give life to somebody else. Walk out of the message today and just, just don't just be inspired, do something. People are writing. I'm going to eat bacon while you write. Just one, one bite. Would you guys stand? Happy Father's Day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for every man and woman in this room right now, God, and and for that program that's in their hands, God, with that that precious stuff that you've written to them. And I pray for courage and for follow-through. God, I pray that they would go and they would speak life, God, and that their life would be about speaking life to other people, Lord. God, we confess to you, Lord, we cannot manage our own mouths, God. We cannot lord over our lips, God. We cannot tame our tongues. It is impossible. We can only beg you to change our hearts. Jesus, would you come and change us? In Christ's name, amen.